Joining us now is John Bavenzi, chair and co-founder of the Bavenzi Group and former COO at the FDIC. John, welcome. Our own Steve Leisman is here as well, and it's a pleasure to have you both. Um, uh, John, I, I, I loved when we sort of spoke to you beforehand. You had more questions than answers, really, about this whole process. What strikes you as most bizarre about what's gone down the last couple of weeks here? Uh, well, the, the, certainly it's the speed of which things are, are happening. Um, it, it's fairly unprecedented. It's it's usually very rare, you know, for it to happen this fast. And the FDIC loves to be able to plan in advance and do things quietly and smoothly without disruption. And uh, when you have something move this fast, you 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 have to improvise a lot. But you <laughs> you're sort of saying, listen. Why did the companies fail outright? Why did the FDIC set up a bridge bank? Why not sell them immediately? Why were un all uninsured depositors protected? I mean, this is the big question, especially with a company like Circle on the hook for $3 billion or more. And that ultimately goes back to the stablecoin products and that's that kind of thing that are involved here. So people are, are looking at this and wondering if it makes sense Look, in the middle of the fight or whatever the term is, okay, you, the, you throw the rule book out the door. but. Uh, what are some of the biggest oddities to you about what should or shouldn't have been done? Well, it, it's not like this was unprecedented and, and hasn't happened before. To me, this is, you know, very reminiscent of the SNL crisis during the, the 1980s. Some of the problems are exactly the same. Uh, these two institutions had big interest rate mismatches um, in the SNL days, it, it was because of, you know, mortgages at 5% when in fighting inflation, interest rates paid to depositors had to go up into double digits. Uh, here, the mismatches were in the long-term securities, but it was the exact same thing that once interest rates went up, uh, these institutions were in big trouble. And so we should, uh, people should have known better. You know, it's also lack of diversification and rapid growth. I mean, rapid growth is uh, is just a red flag to anybody that you've got to look to see if there are problems. And, and these two institutions were had all of those characteristics, just like the SNLs back in the 1980s. Sure, and there have been some feisty exchanges uh, today on Congress. Let's take a listen to one of them uh, where questions are being demanded and, and asked of these regulators. You are not running a consulting operation. Uh, you are running a regulatory operation who can force banks to follow that advice. Um, and interest rates go up, interest rates go down. Certainly our, the Fed in auditing banks ought to know that, especially when this is not a 100-year event. Interest rates go up, interest rates go down. I mean, 2023 has its peculiarities, but it's particularly ironic. It's the Fed that's raising the interest rates, and then the Fed that's not examining banks to see if they can survive if interest rates go up. Let me bring in Steve Leisman on that note, Steve, and what you think some of the ramifications are going to be from these questions and, and these two days of hearings. Well, a lot of it comes down, Kelly, to this notion of whether or not this was a unique failure or there are systemic problems in the way banks are regulating their liquidity issues. I want to go back to what John said, because I've been talking to former regulators, maybe even some former colleagues of John, uh, and I've covered a bunch of bank failures, Kelly. And I think there are three rules in the uh, regulators' bank failure uh, checklist. One is, uh, John said this, identify problems early and have a plan. Two is get to the weekend. And three is sell the bank before you have to close it. None of those seem to be the case in this particular case. They weren't really sure that, that Silicon Valley was close to failure. That was not the appearance earlier in the week. In fact, um, Michael Barr testified this morning that they thought Thursday morning they could uh, make it through the day. $42 billion went out the first day. $100 billion was, rumored, was, was said to be going out the second day. That's when they shut it down. So they could never get to the weekend. Where Why do we do all this stuff on the weekend? Because there's two free days where deposits aren't flowing out. And they couldn't, they had to shut the bank. They couldn't sell a live bank. They had to sell a shuttered bank. And that's one of the reasons why they, uh, the cost is going to be so high. And the issue, I think, for regulators, and maybe John wants to respond to this, is if that's the case, if money can go quicker than ever before, and the regulators can't go to the weekend, 
we're going to be selling more shuttered banks than we are going to be live banks. And so the cost of these bank failures may go up in the, in the future. John? Yeah, that's a, a scary thing, and, and it's going to require a careful look at, you know, how we supervise banks, regulate banks, and, and handle bank closings. Um, the FDIC expects it to cost the insurance fund $22 billion for these two banks. That's an enormous amount of money. Um, it's, you know, by far the most the FDIC's had to, to spend, and, and um, it's— 90 percent of that is because they protected the uninsured depositors here because they were afraid of uh, contagion.